In the beginning, God created the sun, moon, and stars, the animals, trees, and seas. And he made us his own. And he gave us a garden. And there was beauty and peace and life, but that wasn't enough. And so we sinned and we ate and we fell. And where there was once beauty and peace and life, there was now pain and chaos and death. We went from a garden to a grave. But God promised to bring us back, back from the grave into the garden. Days, weeks, years, generations of waiting for the promise, the promise to come back to the garden. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus, friend of sinners, man of sorrows, Lord of glory and light of the world, rejected, refused, condemned and crucified, buried in a borrowed tomb, forsaken and forgotten. But three days later, he stepped out of his grave and into a garden. And the same will be true of all who trust him. Where there is pain and chaos and death, there will be beauty and peace and life. Because Jesus is alive, so is hope. So is grace, so is salvation, so is transformation. Because Jesus is alive, we can step out of the grave and into the garden. Amen. Hi, church. Welcome to The Rock. My name is Josh Whitney, I'm one of the pastors. It's clearly Easter. I've broken out my, my sports jacket. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Two introductory comments. First, last week, uh, Brian spoke on the shame of the cross. His teaching and my teaching are part one and part two of a two-part Easter series. Before we can get into the hope and the joy and the power of the empty tomb, we have to think about the suffering and the shame and the guilt of the cross. And Brian did a fantastic job. If you missed his message last week, please listen to that. Second comment, my teaching today will not be on evidence for the empty tomb. I did a teaching a number of years ago on evidence for the empty tomb. There's a very compelling case that can be made from an apologetics perspective. If you're interested in that, I put the, the reference to the teaching. You could listen to it in your own time. But right now, we're going to get into the power of the empty tomb. And I'd like to pray to start us off. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for spring. We thank you that new life is coming, Lord. We thank you that we get to celebrate your life and that you resurrected because you love us and you wanted to save us, Lord. I thank you for all that you are doing in this church. I ask that you would speak through me right now and teach everyone here by the power of your spirit. We say all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is the most significant event in human history? Have you ever thought about that? I googled it. Google came up with a variety of answers from a bunch of different sources. Some people, they linked it to inventions, like the invention of fire or the wheel, or that's ancient money or the printing press. Others said some of the most significant events in history were about revolutions, the industrial revolution, the scientific revolution, the medical revolution, or the digital revolution. Other websites talked about events like the discovery of the Western Hemisphere, the Protestant Reformation, or the Great Depression, or World War II, but I hate to burst anyone's bubble, but the Googles are wrong. Those are all wrong. The first big idea on your handout, Christ's work on earth, especially his crucifixion and resurrection, is the apex of history. Those are significant events that Google came up with, but Jesus' death and resurrection are even bigger. Why? Because if the Bible is true, every single person who has ever lived will be judged eternally in light of Jesus' death and resurrection. Those two profound events are the foundation of Christianity. They're the bedrock of Christianity, and they have eternal implications for your life. And that's where we're going in this message. So we're going to read the resurrection account from John 19 and 20. You can turn there in your Bible, or I put a huge chunk of the Bible on your handout. So again, the context, Jesus has willingly given up his life on the cross to save us, like Brian talked about last week. So let's jump into John chapter 19, verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. 
And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away his body. And Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So these two men, Joseph and Nicodemus, had been secret followers of Jesus. But they found their courage, and they were willing to be identified with Jesus. And so they took his broken, dead body down off the cross to bury him. They were part of the ruling class of Jerusalem, and they're risking their livelihoods and their reputations to be associated even with the dead body of Jesus. Verse 40, so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, this is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place, this is kind of the key verse, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So they're scrambling to get Jesus buried before the Sabbath. The Jewish Sabbath went from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday, and all Jews stopped working during that period. This is the only gospel, the gospel of John, that tells us where Jesus was crucified, his tomb was nearby. And so they take Jesus' body there, they wrap it in fabric and spices. The spices hide the smell of decay. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that Jesus' mom, Mary, was there, and Mary Magdalene as well. Let's look at a map. Have you ever wondered exactly where Jesus is thought to have been buried? Down at the bottom there, you see that arrow pointing at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's sort of the traditional historical site that is thought to be where Jesus was buried. Up at the top, I've highlighted the garden tomb. That is a second location that some Christians believe that Jesus was buried at. But they're only four-tenths of a mile apart. It's like two Salt Lake City blocks. They're very close together. But nobody knows where Jesus was buried. Why? Because Jesus' body isn't there anymore. His body is gone. That's our next big idea. Jesus' burial site is irrelevant because it's empty. Christ's empty tomb requires every person on the planet to decide what actually happened here, what happened to the body of Christ. You see, the Bible claims that the tomb is empty because Jesus rose from the dead. And you know, the empty tomb makes Christianity unique among the religions of the world. For example, Muhammad, he's buried in the dome in the upper left there. Confucius is buried in China. That's his grave there on the right, upper right. Abraham is thought to be buried in Hebron. That's his grave there on the bottom left. Joseph Smith is buried in Illinois. Don't take my word for it. Do your research. The founder of pretty much every religion in the world has a tomb with a body in it, except Christianity. There's a debate about the tomb location because nobody has the body. Today, we're not celebrating a tomb that has a body in it. We're celebrating an empty tomb. Amen? Amen. Let's continue to read. Let's go to... John chapter 20, verse 1. This is the account of one of the, two of, the one, one of the two most significant events in human history. Now on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, anywhere from 3 to 6 in the morning while it was still dark, and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that's John, the author of this gospel, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. The we, there's another woman here that's not mentioned in John's gospel. And again, this is Sunday. From this day forward, Christians have generally celebrated on Sundays because they're honoring the resurrection of Jesus. She came early to finish the burial process. Remember, they had to wrap it up quickly Friday evening before the Sabbath. So she arrives. She is shocked to discover the tomb is open. She runs to tell Peter and John the body is missing. Notice no one is talking about him being resurrected. It's all about the body being taken. Jesus predicted his resurrection multiple times. We'll see in a minute. But this is more than Mary can believe. She's just thinking in terms of grave robbers. Verse 3, so Peter went out with the other disciple, John, and they were going toward the tomb, and both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So John's letting us all know he's faster than Peter. <laughs> and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. So they're both surprised. They race to the tomb. He looks in, but he does not enter 
Maybe he's scared. He doesn't know what to think. Verse 6, then Simon Peter came, following him, went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. So the bold Peter arrives. He moves past John into the tomb. He sees some strange things. The linen cloths remain. Why would grave robbers unwrap the body? That doesn't make any sense. Why would they fold it up neat and set it there? Verse 8, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, so he's reminding us again he's faster, <laughs> also went in and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So he went in and believed, but he doesn't understand what he's seeing. He knows that something is up, but he's not quite sure what has happened. So let's read about the first witness that sees the resurrected Christ. Verse 11, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. So Mary returns to the tomb. She somehow missed Peter and John going back and forth. She doesn't realize that she is speaking to angels. It's not on her radar that Jesus has risen from the dead. She's like, where have they laid his body? Where is he? But the presence of the angels shows us this is a divine operation. God is on the move. Verse 14, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, because they're in a garden, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, teacher, or Rabboni in Aramaic, so Jesus Christ, who had been brutally nailed to the cross, tortured, gave up his spirit, he died, he is alive, and he is standing in front of Mary. The dead man came back from the grave. His first appearance is to one of his followers, who is a woman, Mary of Magdalene. We do not understand the cultural significance of this, first appearing to a woman. In the first century, women were not considered valid witnesses in court cases. Their testimony was considered inferior. So if someone was making up this story, they would not have their first witness be a woman. It adds historical authentication to the story. But Mary doesn't recognize Jesus at first. Maybe her eyes are full of tears. Or maybe on Friday she saw Jesus so beaten, so bruised, that a healed, resurrected Jesus in front of her, like it doesn't compute in her mind. And remember Brian's message from last week, Jesus received the most horrific abuse before and on the cross. Our word excruciate is from two words, torment and cross. Jesus was so brutalized, Isaiah prophesied we wouldn't even recognize him. But when Jesus said her name, she instantly knew who it was. He wasn't the gardener. This is Jesus because Jesus' sheep know his voice. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. <laughs> and he said all these things to me. <laughs> so she's hugging Jesus because she doesn't want to lose him right now. And then Jesus refers to his ascension. He's only going to be here temporarily, just 40 days. And then he's ascending to heaven. He's going to return one day to reign and rule and judge our earth. She tells him, I have seen Jesus. Jesus is alive. <laughs> So the first person to witness the resurrected Christ was a woman, Jesus. But the big point here is Jesus is alive. He is risen from the dead. He has defeated Satan, sin, and death. And for the record, they still struggled to believe her. They're still hiding which, when Jesus appears in the later verses, which you can read on your own. But the resurrection of Jesus was not on the disciples' radar. How do we know this? When he was arrested, they were scared and they fled. They denied him. They denied ever knowing him. They saw him get tortured. They saw him die. Their hearts are broken. They're hiding in their houses behind locked doors. And all their talk is, somebody stole his body. 
They cannot comprehend that he has risen from the dead. It wasn't on their, their religious perspective. Yes, they believed in a general resurrection of the people in the end of time, but not right now. They're hopeless. They're hiding. They're not sitting around being like, well, Jesus is coming back in just 12 hours, guys. They're hiding. They're terrified. They're behind locked doors. They had expected a conquering Messiah, not a murdered, killed Messiah. Their faith had died when Jesus died. But something transformed the disciples. This is one of the evidences for the empty tomb. The transformation of the disciples. They were no longer afraid to die. Something remarkable happened. They went from running away when Jesus was arrested to most of them dying for their faith. For example, Peter, he was denying Jesus to a servant girl when Jesus was being crucified, but something changed him when he, according to tradition, when he was an old man, he was crucified upside down on a cross. It's almost like when he was being crucified, he's like, he's like, hey, I know what happens. I'm going to come back from the dead. I'm going to be with Jesus forever in heaven. You can't stop me. This is one of the reasons Jesus came to free believers from the fear of death. It says in Hebrews 2, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death Jesus might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. When I read this, I can't help but think of some of our dear Christian friends in our church who passed away last year. They faced their death with courage because they knew the one who had defeated death and that it freed them from the fear of death. Our next big idea, Jesus came in part to free believers from the fear of death. And we see this transformation in the life of the disciples. They needed convincing proof. And Jesus provided many convincing proofs. They talked to him. They touched him. They saw him. They ate with him. And they were so transformed, they did not fear death anymore. Here's a table of some of Jesus, most of Jesus' resurrection appearances. First, he appears to Mary Magdalene, and then the other women, and then the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then the ten disciples are missing Thomas, and then the eleven, and then the seven, and then back to the eleven, and then as many as five hundred, and then obviously he appeared to James and Paul later. It says in Acts 1, he gave many convincing proofs. These men and women needed some convincing. They had seen his body brutalized. They had seen him die. But then Easter morning, Sunday morning, Jesus is alive. He walked out of the tomb. He's resurrected. And that changed the disciples to their core. Their teacher, their mentor, their friend of three years who had died a brutal death is suddenly alive. And they are fundamentally different. The appearance was so convincing that according to tradition, 10 out of the 11 disciples died for their faith. Again, we understand that if Jesus had stayed dead, the disciples would have scattered and Christianity would have died in the cradle. But instead, they went around telling everybody that would listen, Jesus is alive. Jesus came back from the dead and you need to become a Christian. And that message has swept the globe for 2,000 years now, so much so that 2.4 billion people on the planet are celebrating Easter this weekend. It's the number one religion on the planet. One in three people, 2.4 billion people claim to follow Christ. I like how Charles Colson, former aide to President Nixon, he was involved in Watergate, said it. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would have not endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. (laughs) You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. That's so true. You know, you should know that the disciples missed Jesus' clear teaching of his death, burial, and resurrection. I do not expect you to read that. (laughs) But I just put them all on one slide. Matthew 16, 17, 26, Mark 8, Mark 9, Mark 10, Mark 14, Luke 9, Luke 16, and John 2. Jesus said over and over and over again, I'm going to die, and I'm going to come back from the dead. And they missed it. Apparently, they were not paying attention. They missed the memo. 
But this is the defining event of human history, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How do I know this? One small way is that books and stories, fiction authors, fiction writers love to have a resurrection theme in their stories. It's like the worst part and then the best part of the story. Like the hero dies and everyone's crying and it's like the bleakest, worst part of the story. And then the hero resurrects, the bad guy's like, uh-oh. And all the good guys, all the people with the hero are like, all right, it's going to be all right now. My family and I were brainstorming. I came up with a few movies, a bunch of them actually. I'm just going to list a few. I'm not endorsing these films, but they're amazing. <laughs> Thor, remember Thor is struck by the giant robot, the destroyer, falls to the ground, dies, resurrected, beats the robot, and you know everything's going to be better now. Because Thor resurrected. Uh, the Matrix, Neo gets shot by Agent Smith, falls to the ground, dies, resurrects, beats Agent Smith, beats all the bad guys. You know, everything's going to be better now because he resurrected. Uh, Harry Potter, killed by Voldemort, falls to the ground, dies, spends a little time in like magic heaven talking to Dumbledore, <laughs> resurrects, beats the bad guy. You know, everything's going to be better now. One more. Gandalf, battling the fire monster Balrog, falls into the pit, dies. If you want to debate that with me afterward, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Comes back from the dead, and you know, oh, we're going to beat the bad guys now. Gandalf's back. Gandalf the White. There are many more. I'll stop there. You get the idea. All of these movies are simply copycats. They're copycatting the greatest event in the history of this planet, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Church, if the resurrection is true, it changes everything. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis, the professor and author. He said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If true, of infinite importance, the only thing it cannot be is moderately important. That's a great line. It reminds me of this verse in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So the Christian faith rises and falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Christians, we believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. That is what we are celebrating right now. Amen. So why does it matter? Why does the resurrection matter? The reason the resurrection matters is because it confirms or validates what happened at the cross. Without the resurrection, the cross is simply the story of a good man dying a horrific death. But the resurrection shows us that this is the God man who has the power to defeat Satan, sin, and death. Your next big idea, it's an important one, you shouldn't rely on a person to eternally save you who only knows how to die. What you actually need is someone who beat death. And there's only one person that has ever beat death, and that's Jesus Christ. He came out of the grave. He rose victoriously. There's a lot of religious leaders. There's a lot of politicians, a lot of teachers who are long dead and buried, and they taught us a lot of things, but they have no power over death. The power is with the one who rose from the dead in the garden tomb. Do you know that I can tell you all of human history from the perspective of three gardens? First garden, the Garden of Eden, the beginning of human history, the beginning of the Bible. In Genesis 2, it says the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. God created a perfect creation without any sin or death. He created Adam and Eve. They had fellowship with God. There was no sickness, no death, no dying, no curse. It was the perfect paradise with the Lord. Same garden, second scene, something terrible happened. Satan tempted them. They sinned. They disobeyed God. And all of creation was broken. The world was cursed. Adam and Eve were separated from God. Death and sin came into the world. Their fellowship with God was broken, and they were driven from the garden. Genesis 3, therefore the Lord God sent him, sent Adam, out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. So then the second garden, our next scene, is our story. It's the garden tomb where Jesus rose from the dead. 
Let's read our key verse again, John 19. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So God sovereignly orchestrated it so the tomb would have a garden, which is kind of unusual. You don't think gardens and tombs. But he rose from the dead and he spoke to Mary in a garden. Something massive is happening. Again, this is the part of the story where everyone's crying, everything's bleak, everything's sad, everything's dark. The hero has died and then the hero has come back from the dead. And now you know, uh uh-oh, the bad guys are going to get crushed and the good guys with the Lord are going to be all right. It's amazing. Jesus provided a way to beat death and sin, to restore our fellowship with God so we no longer have the fear of death. What Jesus did in this garden right here changes everything. The power, the hope, the grace, the salvation, the transformation can flow into our life because of what Jesus and what he did in this garden where he was resurrected. And then the final garden is at the end of the Bible, at the end of history, Revelation. This is John writing again. The Lord gave him a vision of the new heavens and the new earth. This is the glorious future for believers with the Lord in heaven, Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That sure sounds like a garden to me. It's the restoration of the garden. So the only way from the first garden to the last garden is through the middle garden where Jesus was crucified for our sins and rose victoriously. It also says in Revelation 21, thinking of this future garden, the dwelling place of God is with man. This is your future believer. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. This is where human history is going for believers in Jesus Christ. And I know most of you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to share a big idea with you and a verse. As a Christian, we have the power of Christ. Let me prove it to you. I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm just going to jump in midstream, and we're not going to worry about the context of this verse. I just want to look at one word in one verse. Ephesians 1. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? How did he show that might? That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So the power that raised Christ from the dead has been given to you, believer. On our own, we have no power over grave. We have no power over death. We're all going to die. We don't have the power to stop sinning. We don't have the power to save ourselves. We don't have the power to defeat Satan. But as a Christian, we have been given the power that raised Christ from the dead. This is the word dynamos. It's dynamite. We have been given dynamic power as believers. Christian, you have access to wonder-working power. Are you utilizing that power with your addictions or fighting your sin or growing in your marriage or growing as a parent or your walk with God or your anxiety or godliness? You have access to unbelievable power. Are we walking in the power of Christ? Has the power of sin been broken in our lives? Are we walking in newness of life? Do we live a life that shows everybody, hey, that guy doesn't fear death? Are we showing that Satan has been defeated in our life? I trust we are. But I know that some of you who have joined us have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus spoke about being born again in John chapter 3. I'm going to share two verses to close. First, the words that Jesus shared with Martha when uh, he raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. Uh, John 11, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. This is one of Jesus' great I am statements. He's moving Martha from like a general belief in a future resurrection to her personal belief in his ability to raise her from the dead. And we also see that there is no resurrection without belief in Christ in this verse. And then our last verse, Romans chapter 10, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is the gospel in one verse. All of you who have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's right here. Confess with your mouth. Declare it. Say, Jesus is King. Jesus is the Lord. Believe in your heart. That does not just mean you mentally agree to some facts. That means you put your trust in Christ alone to save you. Maybe you're lacking peace right now. Maybe you're weighed down by the shame and the guilt of your sin. Maybe you're living in fear. Maybe you're trying to save yourself on the religious rat race. Well, here's the good news. It's our last big idea. Believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Eternal life and power are found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the defining event of history because it confirms Jesus' sacrifice. It provides a way for us to be saved, and it gives us a power to live. So I'm going to close this out with prayer. If you would all bow your head. If you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I would invite you to join me in this prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your original creation was perfect. We thank you that Adam and Eve had fellowship with you and that you loved them. Your plan was amazing and perfect in the Garden of Eden. But Lord, we acknowledge that their sin and our sin, everybody's sin has broken this planet. The Bible says that when we sin, we are earning eternal judgment. When we lie and we're angry and we're proud and we lust and we gossip and we're sexually immoral, the Bible says we're earning eternal separation in hell. And Lord, we realize we cannot save ourselves from our sin. But God, we thank you that because of your incredible love for us, you chose to become a man and live a perfect life. You were the perfect sacrifice. You willingly gave up your life to save us. Your body was broken on the cross to save us. And then you were buried in a tomb in a garden. And Lord, today we celebrate the fact that you came out of that tomb alive. You defeated Satan's sin and death. We thank you for the resurrection. And so everyone here who has not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Lord, we confess you are Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. By grace, by faith, you are now a believer. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Please keep your eyes shut and your head bowed. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, would you please raise your hand real high for me? Raise your hand real high. Amen. Amen. Lord, for all of us that have accepted you as our Lord and Savior, we praise you for this Easter celebration. We thank you for the power that you have given us to live this life. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer and you raise your hand, I'm going to be standing over here in this corner with a couple of friends. I have a small gift that I would like to give you. So if you just prayed that prayer, be courageous. You can do it. Meet me in the corner. Thank you.